All right, so what I'll be discussing with you today is um, a good portion of the PhD work I've been doing with Elizabeth Beers out at the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center here in Wenatchee. And uh, this is part of a project where I'm looking at the biodiversity of predatory mites that we're seeing in our apple orchards. So this is probably a familiar face to those of you who've done scouting before. We see a, a predatory mite and he's, she's munching on a little two-spotted spider mite there. So for kind of a, a brief history of how our integrated mite management program in, in Washington developed, um, back in the 60s is when this trend started to become very apparent is that we would see mite outbreaks due to the use of new codling moth pesticides. Basically this idea that the predatory mites that were controlling the spider mite populations would be harmed unintentionally by the sprays used to control codling moth. Fortunately, in the 1960s, uh, Stan Hoyt, who was here in Wenatchee at the time, uh, found that a predatory mite, um, we affectionately call them TIFFs, but Western predatory mite or Gallandromus occidentalis, was resistant to the organophosphates that were being sprayed to control codling moth. Additionally, this predatory mite was a native predator. It didn't have to be introduced, and it was really well adapted to the arid climates here. What this meant is that we could spray these organophosphates and control codling moth while at the same time conserving this predator and not really having to apply too many additional acaricides for mite control. Unfortunately, as many of you know, mite control has become less simple over the last and most recent decades. And there are a couple thoughts as to why this may have occurred. The first is that when Stan Hoyt originally developed our integrated mite management program, the most common pest of apple in terms of mites was McDaniel mite. And I'm going to bet people haven't even seen McDaniels in most of their orchards in a really long time, at least in apple. And then throughout the years, there's been kind of a gradual shift. At one point, two spotted spider mite was more common. And now typically infestations are European red mite with maybe a little two spotted spider mite mixed in. Now this change in pest species is really important because while these two are in the same uh, genus, this one is in a different genus, and this is important because in terms of their behavior, these two will really web up a tree if, if the infestations get really bad. European red mite doesn't do that. And this is important because western predatory mite, our, our predator that we've developed this system on, is very well capable of navigating this webbing, has adaptations to get in there, and, and is behaviorally very good at controlling populations of these two pests. But more importantly, at least I think, is this movement away from organophosphates due to concerns primarily for human health, but also some resistance issues, to new classes of insecticides that are more selective and safer for human workers to use. However, these reduced risk pesticides have been shown to not necessarily always be very friendly to our predatory mites. So it was in part because of these changes in, in what we've seen in the last several decades in our mite management program, but also because no one's ever really looked to say for sure that what we have in our systems out here in Washington Apple is definitely western predatory mite. So we decided to test this assumption by sampling 102 blocks of commercial apple throughout the state. Um, all of our sampling locations are shown on this map. Um, we'd go out, collect 100 leaves randomly from, from a block within an orchard, and this was done um, from 2011 to 2013, typically during the growing season. And here's what we found. So Gallandromus occidentalis, western predatory mite, was indeed the majority of individuals that we found in our samples. But if you'll notice, over 25% are not the mite that we thought we'd find. And more importantly, it's not just kind of a random, random smattering of a few other extra species here or there. There seems to be one other species, Amblygermella cotoglans, that's actually quite common in our orchards that we didn't really realize could survive in commercial apple production. But even more interestingly, we see that it's also the dominant predator in about 20% of the orchards that we sampled. And the, and the colors here match where we're finding them. So it's not really regionally based, they're kind of smattered throughout the state. But that means that if any mite biological control is occurring in the orchards that are labeled in blue here, it's not western predatory mite, it's not a tiff. It's this different species of predatory mite. <laughs> 
So what we essentially have is a case where most likely in, in your apple orchard you could have one or the other or a mix of both of these two species. And they're actually quite different in their biology although they look quite similar until you get them basically slide mounted and extremely magnified under a microscope. The big difference is being that cotyglans actually prefers to eat things that aren't in the tetranychus genus, the ones that cause all that webbing. They like pananychus, they like eating rust mites, um, so maybe they're a better predator than occidentalis, maybe not, because it prefers, like I said, these web producing species. Additionally, we know that the TIF, western predatory mite, is organophosphate tolerant. What we don't know is just how organophosphate susceptible cotyglans is. So what I've dis decided to do was, was test some of these things in, in the laboratory and determine exactly how these species are different. So first I looked simply at how long they spend in each life stage. Just like pest mite species, they, they go through life stages. So how long was spent in the egg, the larva, protonymphs, pseudonymphs, and then the total time spent. And while there are some, some statistical differences between the amount of time spent in each life stage, and, and that results in occidentalis having a shorter life cycle overall, it can, it can become a, an adult and start reproducing faster than, than this other species, it's by like half a day. So it's, it's not really anything that's probably going to be important for practical purposes. And the same is true for their ability to survive through each stage in, in laboratory conditions. Some slight differences at the egg stage, but again, nothing that's, that's really that practically important. What is interesting, however, is that they do have some differences in what they prefer to consume, and indeed what they can consume when it comes to prey. So this was a, a diet test. One diet, they were fed only eggs of two-spotted spider mite, and another diet, they were fed only protonymphs. So here, it actually appears, in terms of how many prey they're consuming in a day, that, that cotyglans, the new predatory mite, is actually doing a lot better than occidentalis, and then when it comes to protonymphs, they're about the same. But if you look at the eggs that they're capable of laying and the offspring that they produce when fed on these diets, Cotyglans actually basically stops laying eggs if you only feed it two spot eggs as its diet. And I think this is indicative that this probably isn't the, the ideal prey for it and that it prefers to feed on something else, like European red mite. But what's really interesting is as part of this survey, we were also able to talk with all the pest consultants of, of these blocks of uh, apple that we sampled and ask them questions. So obviously when it comes to geography, we can get that from a GPS. But we were also able to ask them about the variety of the block, how old the block was, management practices, um, some of the different pesticides that have been used in the past years, um, what prey were available, and if they'd noticed any problems with some of these pest mite species, um, temperature data, and then what the surrounding landscape was like. Is it more apple? Is it cherry? Are you planted uh, near sage? Uh, questions like that. And we were able to get this information um, using a, a survey website it's called SurveyMonkey. The uh, crop data we got from CropScape, which is a service provided by the USDA that allows for remote sampling of orchards and basically classify what kind of agriculture is where all across the United States. And then finally, our uh, weather data we got from AgWeatherNet, which is provided by WSU. So what we managed to find is we were able to take all of this data uh, put it into a statistical model selection procedure and it comes out with what matters, what's actually causing one species to be more abundant than another in a given orchard. And it turns out that Occidentalis or the TIFFs were positively affected by the use of bifenazate, acromite, and positively affected by conventional sprays, they were lower in organic orchards. Whereas cotyglans was negatively affected by acromite use, positively affected by the presence of more weedy herbicide strips, and didn't seem to be as prevalent in golden delicious orchards as opposed to others. And I'll, we'll go through these one by one. So first, looking at acromite use, it's clear that these two mites are completely oppositely affected by this. And while it may make sense that, okay, acromite is having unintentional non-target effects on the one predator, cotyglans, this seems to allow Occidentalis populations to get higher. It doesn't have another predator to compete with for food or other resources. So this is going to be something that strongly drives competition between these two predators.
As I mentioned, Oxidant Talus was a lot lower in organic orchards. So those of you who manage organic acreage um, are likely to see either cotoglans or even a different species of predatory mite present in your orchards uh, for mite biological control. And this is once again due to the idea that it's able to thrive in these pesticide uh, in, uh, situations. Basically, it can outcompete the other predators, which can't. In terms of weediness, uh, cotoglan seems to prefer um, strips that were categorized as basically half weeds, half grass, or even more on the weedy end than grass. Um, this is either maybe because it's providing some kind of shelter or extra resource to cotoglans, or, or maybe it actually has some problems with herbicide management. This we can't quite exactly tease a cause and effect, but we do know that there's a correlation here. And then finally, uh, cotoglans was indeed lower in, in golden delicious varieties. And there's actually a pretty strong body of research showing that a lot of predatory mites prefer uh, red delicious and other varieties that are, oh there it is, that are really hairy. So here's a red delicious leaf versus the smoother surface of golden delicious leaves. Uh, those hairs on the apple leaves tend to give them surfaces to cling onto, to lay eggs on, and can trap some humidity and, and help them with their reproduction. So this has implications both for ecology and then how you're practically managing an orchard. And it's basically that in an orchard with fewer agricultural inputs, namely pesticides, you're more likely to see this other species, Amblygemelicata glands, in large abundances. Whereas if you have a more traditionally managed conventional orchard, you're more likely to still see our usual tiff or western predatory mite. What's interesting is that uh, Brian Croft about 10 years ago actually predicted that while we'd seen western predatory mite or occidentalis in orchards where pesticides were used, as we move away from these traditional uh, broad spectrum pesticides to more biologically based selective pesticides, we would see different mite species in our orchards and that turned out to be exactly the case. Finally, I'll, I'll summarize a little bit of work we've done to, to look at exactly how some pesticides, and we've, we've chosen kind of a wide variety of classes here, affect these two mite species. The first, um, obviously, we included the list because it was indicated as important in our survey. But then also we included guthion or azimphos methyl because we can't use it anymore. So what's, what's going to be the effect of this no longer being in our system? Does it seem to favor one of these predatory mites over the other? And then just kind of a, a radum smattering from, from other pesticide classes that are commonly used in orchards. So this is looking at mortality data, and uh, corrected mortality is, is simply accounting for mortality that we saw in our, our control mites that received no pesticide treatment. So this is, can be thought of as straight percent mortality. So anything green means it's, it's not that harmful to the mites. Uh, yellow is kind of in the middle, and then red is, is fairly harmful in terms of directly causing mortality to females when tested. Um, so as you can see, Occidentalis is fairly tolerant of most of the pesticides. Uh, we know it doesn't like Pravada. It's been pretty well shown that, um, that uh, neonicotinols are not very kind to predatory mites. Delegate is another problem uh, pesticide. But for the rest, for the most part, not a lot of mortality. However, Cotoglan seems to be susceptible to many more different kinds of pesticides, specifically seven. And guess what? Guthion. So that, that organophosphate that western predatory mite had developed resistance to, we're not seeing that resistance in cotoglans. So it's possible that as we move away from guthion use and in organic orchards where they don't use seven for fruit thinning, once again, you're probably going to see this predatory mite. This is an interesting case. Uh, many of you know that acromite has actually been labeled as, as safe for most beneficials including predatory mites. However, if you read the label, it actually lists all of the organisms that were tested. And of course it includes Occidentalis. It's a, it's a big and important orchard predator. But you know, no one ever thought to test this species because we didn't know it was that common in orchards to begin with. So I think this, this points to the importance of not assuming what's good for one predator will be okay for the other predator. So to summarize the results that our, our lab has found with, with these two predatory mites is that basically we have this, this new mite, although it's likely been there in small numbers all along, it's a change in management practices that's allowed it to kind of flourish. It has different feeding preferences than our traditional western predatory mite or tiff that may make it a better predator of European red mite, maybe not. <laughs> 
but it is definitely more sensitive to pesticide disturbance than western predatory mite, which means that if you're managing a very low impact conventional or organic orchard that you're, you might be actually seeing this mite in, in large abundances in comparison to what we were actually expecting. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, um, I won't read this slide because a whole bunch of people, as you can imagine, helped with a survey of this size, um, but since I'm at this particular meeting, I'd especially like to thank all of the pest consultants that filled out that survey for me, were willing to let me wander around in their orchards collecting samples. This basically couldn't have been done without that kind of cooperation. So I thank you for that, and I'm open to any questions. Um, so based upon, I haven't done any specific studies with rust mite feeding, um, so in terms of which one of these two mites would be a better predator, I can't say based on my own experience, but looking back at the literature, they both seem to be equally good at rust mite suppression, but cotyglans does have, seem to have a slight preference for eating rust mite that's not as strong as oxidantalis. So it may end up being better to some extent. All right, thank you.